Hey, it's Jack Heald with uh, the Hack Jack's Brain podcast, and I'm here today with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Is it Ove or Ovadia? Ovedia. Ovedia. Uh, Dr. Ovedia is a heart surgeon, and strangely enough, I don't know that we're going to talk a lot about surgery, uh, and I'm going to let him uh, introduce himself a little bit more before we dive into what I think is going to be a really interesting conversation about uh, health care and sick care in, uh, in the United States. So, Dr. O, Phil, tell us about yourself real quick. Thank you, Jack, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Um, so, as you mentioned, I am a heart surgeon, but uh, I've really kind of refocused my career. Uh, while I continue to do heart surgery, uh, my mission has become to teach people and educate people on how not to need heart surgery. And I think that's going to be kind of a focus on our, of our conversation. And I think the, you know, I, I think we'll get into that the need, the overwhelming need for heart surgery in our healthcare system is, is kind of a symptom of what's wrong with our healthcare system. And so I look forward to getting into that more with you. All right. So cardiac surgeon, um, Let's start with a little bit of history. How did you decide to become a surgeon? That is, that's one of those careers that, as best as I can tell, picks the practitioner rather than the practitioner picking the career. Yeah, you know, that, that's a, a pretty good observation. And I think in many cases that's true. And I would have to say in my case that's certainly true because um, if you ask my parents from when I was very little, you know, four or five years old. Um, you know, many kids say they want to be a doctor, uh, but they they claim that I always said I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, I never said I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be that a surgeon. And uh, honestly, I, I don't have a good, uh, you know, reason for that, a good explanation for that. Um, you know, I, I don't have any other doctors in my family. Uh, the only thing, you know, that I can kind of reconstruct uh, in, in a little bit of retrospect is my brother was, uh, you know, a little bit ill when I was growing up. He was a type 1 diabetic. And, you know, I kind of remember uh, the time that he got diagnosed with that. Uh, so I would say, you know, that probably played a role in my interest in medicine. Uh, but as to why I, I you know, kind of chose surgery or surgery chose me, uh, you know, I don't have a good uh, real explanation for that. Um, but as I kind of went through medical school and, uh, you know, the, the desire, my, my drive to be a surgeon uh, only strengthened and, uh, you know, it, uh, and that's what I ended up doing and, and that's what I love doing. So I have a, I, I have a theory about how the aliopathic medical establishment works. I'm going to run it by you in a minute. But first, I'd like you to just real quickly, I think I know, but, but I would like you to, to tell us, what is the process that you had to go through in terms of education and experience to become allowed to practice heart surgery? Sure thing. Uh, so, you know, after uh, graduating high school, um, you know, I did my undergraduate work and then uh, medical school. Uh, I, I did things on an accelerated basis. So traditionally, you know, it's four years of undergraduate school and four years of medical school. I went through an accelerated program uh, that allowed me to do that in six years combined. Um, and uh, so, you know, because I knew that's what I wanted to do, I was able to get into one of those programs. And uh, so I completed my, undergra my undergraduate work and then my medical school in six years. And then um, I did a, a residency program, an internship and a residency program in general surgery. Uh, so that it basically, you know, prepares you to do uh, 
all of the uh, kind of abdominal surgery, uh, you know, chest surgery, head and neck surgery, um, except for, you know, there are certain surgical specialties that have kind of selected out from that, things like orthopedics and neurosurgery. But otherwise, uh, at least at the time that I went through training, it's trained, it's changed a little bit since then. You know, you traditionally did a general surgery residency, which was five years. And then uh, knowing that I wanted to go into cardiac surgery or cardiothoracic surgery, which is chest surgery, uh, I then did an additional uh, two years of training uh, in specifically in cardiothoracic surgery after that. So uh, seven years of training in total after completing medical school. And that got me to the point that I was uh, ready to you know, go out into practice, as they call it. So you're, I'm guessing, 31, 32 years old at this point, and you're cutting into people's chests. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Zoiks. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so here you are, cardiac surgeon, and uh, you gave me a little bit of background. Uh, you said you went from being an obese, quote, unquote, mainstream cardiac surgeon to a healthy, quote, unquote, rebel MD. Let's talk, before we get into the rebel part, let's talk about the obese mainstream part. How'd you get yeah, there? Sure. So, you know, I, I pretty much was, you know, always obese. I, I grew up, you know, as a child, I was obese and... That was your brother, uh, too. Uh, so interesting. Yes, but not as much. So my brother, uh, as I mentioned, was type one diabetic. Uh, he, I would say, was a little bit overweight, but not obese. Uh, uh, but, you know, that that kind of goes along with type one diabetes. Uh, and then I have a sister as well. And she was obese. And both my parents were obese. Wow. And, you know, again, in, you know, looking back, um, we were kind of, you know, I would put us in that prototypical standard American family. Uh, you know, we, this was, I grew up in the, uh, you know, late seventies and the early eighties and the U S dietary guidelines had come out and the food pyramid. And we ate pretty much in line with that. And, and I would say we even okay. eat. When you even, say you ate pretty much in line, yeah. talk about what that meant. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then I was going to say, you know, having a brother with who was a type one diabetic probably meant we ate on the healthier side of, you know, the food pyramid. So we did not have any sugar in the house, you know, with my brother, uh, you know, any soda we had was diet soda. Uh, and then, you know, we had the low fat, uh, you know, kind of versions of everything. We had margarine instead of butter. We drank skim milk. Uh, we had the, you know, heart, the, the healthy cereals, the Cheerios and the Wheaties and, and the Raisin Bran. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I would say a, a pretty, you know, decent amount of meat, uh, but, you know, more lean meats, chicken, uh, you know, and uh, leaner red meats. And, uh, you know, didn't really use a lot of oils to cook with, you know, the oils we used were vegetable oils and, uh, canola, you know, that type of stuff, mainly vegetable okay, so, oils. So I got it. That just begs the question. Why were you obese? And that, that, that's a good question because the flip side, you know, most people would say, oh, well, you probably weren't very active. And the reality is I was very active. I played sports year round. Uh, every season I was in a sport. Um, I rode my bike to my friend's house. I walked to school or rode my bike to school, you know, much of my childhood. I was always out and around the neighborhood. You know, this is pre video game era. And uh, I certainly wasn't a couch potato. So there I was active and eating according to the way that we were told to eat. And yet I was obese my entire childhood. And it got worse. You know, I went to college and I got more obese despite being more active. Um, you know, college was probably the most active time of my life and I continued to get more obese. And then I went to medical school where, you know, one would logically think, well, you know, you learn how to get healthy in medical school. Right. And I got more and more obese. And, and you know, admittedly, uh, my eating habits, you know, probably got a little worse. You know, you're eating 
again, ironic, this is going to sound ironic, but I was eating in the hospital all the time, which was not great food. Um, you know, and of course there was the stress and not sleeping and, and those types of things go into it. But, uh, again, um, you know, objectively one would look at that and say, I should have been set up to be healthy. You know, again, I remained active, you know, so all through medical school, for instance, you know, I didn't have a car. I walked everywhere or took the subway. Wow. I was in Philadelphia. Uh, I did my training, um, you know, in uh, New Jersey and then in Boston. Uh, again, you know, I, I would say I was, you know, uh, you walk a lot around the hospital all day sure. long. Uh, you're on your feet operating all day. So, you know, it, it, it's not a sedentary lifestyle. I mean, granted, I, I, I wasn't, you know, at the gym all the time, but uh, still, you know, and, and I was eating all my meals almost, you know, in the hospital. So, so you're uh, eating you hospital would... prepared meals. Yep. You're active. You're not driving a car back and forth everywhere you go. You're walking all the time and you're obese. Have I basically summarized it correctly? That basically summarizes it correctly. And, you know, I got to a point. Uh, so I remember uh, it was my last year of my general surgery training, what's called the chief resident year. And I was on the uh, bariatric surgery rotation. So that's the, you know, weight loss surgery rotation. And this was a relatively new kind of field uh, when I was doing it. And uh, the training program I was at, the place I was at, I was working with one of the pioneers you know, in the field. And what I realized one day is that I qualified to have that surgery done. I was overweight enough uh, that I could have qualified to have that done. And I said, I got to do something about this, you know. So I did what I was taught to do. Eat less, move more. Uh, this was also, I remember right, uh, when the Palm pilots had come out, you know, Oh yeah. and so I downloaded the program to track my nutrition. I started tracking every calorie I ate and, uh, you know, I took opportunity. There was a gym attached to the hospital. Uh, so between surgeries, I would go to the gym, I would work out, I would get up in the morning. I would, you know, I really started working out and, and you know, I lost weight. Um, I probably lost about 50 pounds and, uh, you know, and I, you know, I said, okay, you know, I'm on the right path. And then over the next year or two, I would, I gained back the 50 pounds and more. Oh, God. And I went through this cycle a couple more times. And, and anyone who struggles with obesity knows this, you know, you do the Weight Watchers, you do the Nutrisystem. I, I did all of these things. And, you know, I'd lose a little bit and gain it back. And, and typically each time I gain more and more. And, uh, you know, that just continued through uh, now my cardiac surgical training and then, you know, the early part of my career as a cardiac surgeon. I had a, uh, the very first interview I did on this podcast was a guy who lost a hundred and I want to say 130 pounds. Um, and he completely changed his own life. How much weight did you end up losing ultimately? Yeah. So from my high point to where I kind of maintain today is, uh, right over, you know, just about a hundred pounds, a little bit over a hundred pounds uh, All right. that I'm able to maintain. So here we've got another guy who's lost a hundred pounds. Now this guy was a programmer, your typical sitting in the basement, Cheetos on his chest, playing world of Warcraft at night and programming during the day kind of programmer who you would not expect to really have a particularly strong grasp on how to be healthy. So, you know, we kind of give him a pass. How in the hell does a medical doctor with seven years of advanced training plus three years crammed, four years crammed into three years of medical school Plus, what was your what was your undergraduate in? Probably biology or something. Uh, yeah, exactly. So you're you've got three, six, thirteen. You've got thirteen years of advanced training. In all that time, did anybody in the 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 system that trains healthcare air quotes professionals ever have a sit down with you and say? Hey, Phil, you're obese. 
Did that ever happen? Uh, that that never happened. And so tell me about how much training you had in nutrition. Yeah, so I would say if you added up the 13 years, like you said, that I went through between you know school and residency uh, and fellowship, um, I would put it at probably single digit hours total spent on nutrition, uh, probably somewhere in the eight hour range total over those 13 so years. So 13 years, you had eight hours of training in nutrition. Yes. And, and I would even tell you, you know, that that eight hours was really not even how to eat to be healthy. Um, it was more on the sort of biochemistry of nutrition. You know, what is a carbohydrate? What is a protein? What is a, you know, dietary fat? How does our body metabolize these? Um, and really, you know, and, and the only, you know, kind of guidance on how to eat healthy was pretty much the U.S. dietary guidelines. Now, you and I are roughly the same age. I graduated from high school in 78, college in 82. I remember very clearly being told that fats were bad, uh, margarine was good, butter was bad, eggs were bad. I remember very clearly those, those official U.S. approved USDA approved guidelines. <clears throat> and even then, I remember thinking to myself, there is no possible way that is, that's true. There's just no way. Um, but I'm wired to just, <laughs> I distrust authority just because that's how I am. Um, was, there any, was there any point along the whole process where you thought to yourself, was there any kind of cognitive dissonance about your own state of not well-being and the the career that you were in? You know, there really wasn't. Um, you know, I think medicine, you know, going through the process to become a doctor really does not lend itself to that sort of, you know, critical thinking and, and, and cognitive dissonance that, you know, you were at least able to have. Okay. Uh, so I want to, I want to stop that. you right there. Yeah. I want to ask you to repeat that last sentence. Yeah. Going through. Yeah. Medical going training. through the training to become a medical doctor really does not allow for much critical thinking. Now I'm not surprised by that today. But I do remember the first time when I realized that that was, in fact, the nature of medical training. That it, and and here's where I go into my theory, and I want to, and and this is really what I want to talk to you about. I have observed in our culture, and by our culture, I don't merely mean the United States, which is where we're broadcasting or podcasting from. I mean Western culture in general, all of of the culture that is essentially springs from uh, Judeo-Christian ethics and the Greek and Roman cultures that were built upon those. Um, I've observed that at now, in our time, 2021, that deception of all kinds plays a central role in all of life in all of our institutions and with i don't think this applies to to our conversation but i have observed that artists always intuitively know what's going on and what is coming and i've been watching television shows movies plays that have been created in the last 15 to 20 years with this eye and one thing i've noticed is that all drama almost without exception, turns on some sort of deception. Whether it's an out-and-out -out lie or a failure to tell the truth and allow people to think something that's not true, or by acting out a deception, either by what, they, what someone does or does not do. And it seems like all of our dramas revolve around some kind of deception. The artists intuitively know this. I don't think that they're thinking to themselves, ah, I'm going to create a, a drama and the, the pivot point is going to be a deception. 
I really don't think that's how these true artists work. I think there's more an intuitive kind of, of grasping of the gestalt of the, of the culture and, and their creativity. They almost subconsciously find that pivot point. Having said that, with that as, as the groundwork, I would like you to, to just speculate, talk with me about the role of deception in the education of a medical doctor. And I don't mean, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying people who willingly and knowingly tell, say something that's not true. I'm talking about a broader definition of deception where you allow other people to believe something is true through what you say or what you don't say through what you do or what you don't do. That's what I mean by deception. So, so knowing where we're going, we're going to talk about your transition to a rebel MD. Talk about, if you can, just think through. Can you see where failure to deal with the truth played a role, a significant role in your upbringing as a, as a surgeon, in your training as a surgeon, in your practice as a medical doctor? Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't think, need to, to bait the witness here, but yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> I think when you look at the way that, the, you know, the, our healthcare system has evolved, um, it's evolved to a point where um, things are professed to be truth that cannot be questioned. And um, <coughs> sorry, um, you know, so some of these things that are professed to be truth uh, are, are not actually truth. You know, m much in medicine is not truth. And we know uh, you know, there, there, so there's a common trope in medical school that says, you know, half of what you learn in medical school is going to be proven to be wrong by the time you finish your career. We just don't know which half. And despite the number of times that you hear that as you go through medical school, when you go through medical training, if you try and question these truths, it's just immediately shut down, you know. The, the, the prevailing what do you mean attitude by it's shut down. What do you mean by that? Well, so the prevailing attitude is, you know, there's so much information to learn. The volume of information that needs to be learned to become a physician these days uh, is so great that you just don't have time to question these things. And if, for instance, if, you know, thinking back, if I did have wow. the foresight to, you know, if I was in that nutrition class, the two hours that it was. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, some of the things that I know now, you know, that just don't make sense. Like, you know, okay, we've had the US dietary guidelines for 40 years and our health as the nation as a nation has continued to deteriorate. You know, maybe there's a problem with the guidelines. Uh, you know, that wouldn't have even been entertained. Uh, there's just no room for debating these uh, truths. You know, it's just, you know, basically kind of memorize these facts, you know, learn how to go through the uh, learn how to be, you know, be practice according to the guidelines uh, is the way medicine is largely uh, run these days. And there just isn't room in the system, uh, you know, especially for trainees, you know, people who are learning to, to question, the, you know, these these uh, beliefs, you know, in medicine. And, and that's really what they are. So what happens to the, the folks who, who won't sit down, shut up, and just do what they're told? Well, I think they get selected out of the system pretty early on, to be honest. You know, uh, I mean, you, you, don't, you, you just don't see those people in medicine anymore. You know? And again, it, it's unfortunate and it's, uh, you know, I guess a little bit you know, ironic because you know, medicine was built uh, on you know, innovators and creative thinkers. And, and, you know, especially when you look at something like heart surgery. So, you know, most people don't actually realize that heart surgery didn't exist, you know, prior to, 
you know, 1956 was essentially kind of the beginning of heart surgery in in the world, you know, in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, the guy, the first people who did heart surgery, the first surgeons who did this stuff were, you know, wildly, you know, innovative, creative, outside the box thinkers. And, you know, you can find these examples all through medicine um, and, and really, you know, that doesn't that largely doesn't exist in the in the healthcare system anymore. Um, you know, the healthcare system has evolved. To whoa, a whoa, point whoa! Where it largely doesn't exist in the healthcare system anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you try and find great innovations like you know the 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 heart, you know, the development of the heart lung bypass machine. You know, again, you know, 1950s, and it's a great story. You know, couple of many books written about it. Uh, if anyone wants to dive into it, but um, you know, you look for innovations like that occurring today in medicine, and you know, I, I would be very hard pressed to find anything that would be, you know, anywhere close to that level of innovation. You know, we we have more of just, you know, the innovations today in medicine are, you know new versions of medicines come out or, you know, right. new medicines come out. Uh, you know, yeah, the and, patent and, on, on this particular medicine is expiring, yeah. so we need to make a, a, a single change to a single molecule so that we can re-up the patent so that we yeah. can or, keep or, the money machine going. You know, tweaks to surgical procedures that make them, you know, less invasive, safer. And, and those are all great, you know, things. But, you know, they're not the level of innovation from, you know, not being able to operate on the human heart to being able to operate on the human heart, uh, you know, uh, that, that we went through. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I, but, but again, that I, one, you know, that get, one, that one shocked me. Yeah. Getting back to your, you know, your, you know, kind of theme around deception, I would say the deception that proceed that, you know, that is most pervasive in medicine is that, a lot of things that are, you know, purported to be absolute truths uh, are not. And uh, but, you know, th there's there's not even, you know, there's no room to question these truths. So when I look at things like, you know, the healthiest way to eat is the U.S. dietary guidelines, uh, you know, that that is an absolute truth in, in medicine, you know, that if you start to question that. Uh, as I and many others have, um, you know, you're immediately viewed as a, you know, as a heretic, as an outsider. I have a theory, and I love that you use that word heretic. Um, all progress is the result of heretics. Um, so I, let's, let's follow that path a little bit now. Um, so you're a surgeon, you're a heart surgeon, which I guess maybe in the, the pantheon of awesomeness ranks right up there with brain surgeons. You know, fix my brain, fix my heart, you're a demigod. And yet, I'm guessing you are, if you've lost 100 pounds, you are horrendously unhealthy. What was your... Uh, what happened that you were able to go from that state to where you are now? What well, was there a pivotal moment? Yeah, so there, there were two pivotal moments, and you know, again, they very much demonstrate, you know, sort of what's wrong with healthcare. In that, you know, they both came from essentially outside the standard healthcare system. So the first moment was, um, you know, uh, we, my wife and I had had our uh, two children at this point, and um, my wife was suffering after having the second uh, daughter. My wife just had horrible heartburn all the time. Ooh, this and, sounds familiar. Yeah, and you know, was doing, you know, again, she was a nurse, I was a doctor, you know, so we did what healthcare said. You know, she took her tums and her antacids and her, you know, proton pump inhibitors getting to the big, you know, sort of medicines and, uh, you know, but still had horrible heartburn. Wow. And she actually went and saw unrelated reasons, but she, she was seeing an acupuncturist, you know, for not 
for her heartburn, but you know, she was discussing this and the acupuncturist suggested to her that she try eliminating gluten from her diet. And my wife comes home and tells me this. And again, you know, I was mainstream, you know, heart surgeon back then. And I said, well, that sounds kind of crazy. You know, you don't have, you know, and you're not celiac, which is the disease associated with gluten sensitivity. Um, you know, but I'm a supportive husband. If you want to try it, honey, I'll try it with you. And so, you know, we went gluten free and this was 2015. So, you know, they didn't have a lot of the gluten free everything back then. You know, it just yeah. meant basically eliminating bread and pasta and those types of things. And we went gluten free and I noticed pretty much immediately that I felt better. My energy level was better. I wasn't getting tired in the afternoon. You know, I wasn't falling asleep, you know, in my office uh, or, you know, needing the, you know, multiple cups of coffee. And, you know, I, I lost maybe a little bit of weight, but, you know, I really didn't notice the weight loss. I just noticed I had better energy and, and you know, a little better mental clarity. And, you know, I said, oh, that's interesting, but it still didn't really click in. The moment that really clicked in for me was uh, January 2016. I was at a uh, medical conference, Society of Thoracic Surgeons, uh, actually in your neck of the woods in, in Phoenix. And uh, Gary Tobbs was the invited speaker to that meeting. And Gary, for those who don't know, is an investigative journalist who had uh, basically done a, a it started with a piece for the New Yorker on the diet industry. It turned into a book, uh, why good calories, bad calories, and why we get fat. And, um, you know, so Gary's the invited uh, speaker at this meeting. And I'm looking at the agenda and I'm like, why do they have some journalists talking to, you know, a bunch of heart surgeons? <laughs> but I'm like, okay, you know, I'll listen to the talk. And, and, Gary started talking and immediately just, you know, caught my attention. And, and Gary talks about, you know, the role of sugar and carbohydrates and hormones in obesity, uh, as opposed to the standard, you know, calories in, calories out, which is all I had ever learned in medical school. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I particularly remember from that talk is Gary gives the example of, he said, look around this room, you know, there are 2000 people sitting in this room and picture you're at the back of the room standing by the doors there and someone pokes their head in the door and says, why are there so many people in this room? And you say, well, more people have walked in than have walked out. And he says, technically that's true, but it doesn't give you any information. And he said, that's basically what calories in calories out is, you know, Yes, it's true that if you become obese, you've obviously, you know, taken in more calories over your life than you've put out, but it doesn't tell you why. And, and you know, and then he, you know, basically uses that as the launching point for his discussion on hormones and sugar and carbohydrates and insulin. And, um, you know, it just for the first time in my life, it clicked. It made sense. And I've read his books and I started, you know, low carbohydrate and I lost a ton of weight, you know, effortlessly. And I've been able to keep it off now for five plus years, uh, you know, within that general framework. Uh, you know, there's been some evolution within that framework, but that's the general framework. And, you know, it occurred to me probably two or three years into the journey, you know, I'd lost the weight. I was keeping it off. I was feeling great. Uh, and, you know, I started to really think about why didn't I ever learn this in medical school? You know, yeah. why, why yeah, again, you exactly. talk about the deception. And then as you get deeper and deeper into this, and some of Gary's books go into this and, and many others have gone into it, you start to realize that all of this information was known, is known, is in the medical literature. You can go back to, there were papers from the late 1800s talking about obesity and the treatment for obesity is restricting sugar and carbohydrates. And, you know, wow. and yet here we are a hundred plus years later. And the only message you get is, you know, low fat, count your calories, uh, you know, and, and no, no real focus on, uh, you know, what, I, what I've now come to learn as metabolic health. Uh, so though that is the deception that, you know, continues to go on in medicine. 
And uh, that is the deception that I finally had my eyes open to and so, has kind of gotten me to where I am today. So what did your colleagues, what were, what, what were your colleagues saying to you as they see this weight start falling off of your body? Well, you know, you, the typical interaction goes something like, oh, Phil, you look great. You know, you must, you know, what are you doing? And you start to tell them and they're like, oh, well, that's great. But, you know, you're eating all that fat. So you're going to get heart disease. You know, you're going to be dead of a heart attack in no time. I mean, I hear this all the time and especially, obviously, as a cardiac surgeon and interacting with cardiologists, you know, everyone's kind of horrified to hear my now, you know, high fat, high saturated fat diet. Uh, and so, you know, that that's the common reaction. And again, it's that disconnect between they see how much healthier I obviously am. You clearly can't be healthy because yeah. you're not eating what you were told to eat. In but, spite know, of the fact that I can see that you've lost a hundred pounds and right. aren't obese anymore. Right. Wow. And, you know, the, this has got to be killing you despite making you more healthy it is still really the, uh, you know, the narrative. What do you, how do you, how do you, I'm not asking what you say to them, Yeah. but what happens in your head when you are confronted with this kind of, for me, I don't know a better word for it than just blindness. I can yeah. see with my own eyes, you're not obese anymore. And yet my programming tells me, Clearly, you're killing yourself now. What do you, how do you respond to that in, in, yeah, internally? Yeah, internally, honestly, these days, it's really just kind of sadness because I realize, you know, I understand that they're, you know, products of the system. I see how the system, you know, gets them to that point. And, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of a little, it, it's just sort of sadness that they can't quite break through that, you know, through that deception. I mean, that, and, and you know, admittedly, having gone through it, it is a major, it, it's sort of, you know, one of those life changing, you know, earth shaking moments, like, you know, right. when I finally got to that point, you know, uh, so along the journey, you know, one of the real, you know, even more so than, you know, the US dietary guidelines and all that is, you know, cholesterol causes heart disease. I right. mean, that is as about an absolute truth. You know, the cholesterol we eat in our diet is the direct cause of heart disease. And people who have elevated, you know, specifically what's called bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol levels are at the highest risk of heart disease. And when I discovered that that is not, you know, truly proven, uh, there is a lot of a lot of reasons to doubt that. And there's a lot of interpretation that goes into that data. Um, you know, that was truly the groundbreaking, you know, earth shattering moment for me because now I was a heart surgeon who no longer believed that cholesterol was the true cause of heart disease. You, you now talk about metabolic health and I hear the word metabolism. I know when I was a young man, I had a high metabolism whatever that means. Basically what it meant was I could eat about 5,000 calories of crap a day and I couldn't put on an ounce. Um, and then I got to my mid thirties and my, my metabolism slowed down and I got that little roll around the middle. What is, what is this whole idea of metabolic health and does it have anything to do with this metabolism thing that, that I've heard about all my life? Yeah, it does. You know, so, you know, metabolism and metabolic health broadly are, you know, that the body is able to properly utilize the inputs you're giving it. So, you know, food is building blocks and energy for our bodies. Uh, and, you know, when someone is metabolically healthy, the food that they're taking in along with some other signals like, you know, the sunlight, the air we're breathing and all those things. Um, but our body is basically using these things appropriately. And, you know, there is a couple of things that our body can do with, you know, these inputs. You can use it to build and repair tissue. 
you can use it to when you say uh, build build I, I think repair tissue makes sense to me but build yeah. tissue is like if you're lifting weights it helps you build bigger build more muscle or bigger muscles yeah or or even if you're a growing child you know you're you're building muscle but our, the reality is is that even as adults you know who are not obviously growing uh we're still constantly turning over you know breaking down and renewing the tissues uh okay. and so you know that's part of what we use these inputs for we use food for um there's all, all right, your daily so two things building blocks and energy yep and then the right. energy just to do what you do on a daily basis all the things that are going on in your body plus all the movements and all of that that you're doing uh, and then, you know, a certain amount of it is supposed to go for storage because, you know, it, when you look ancestrally, there were times when food wasn't readily available. Right. So you need to have a storage that, you know, we wouldn't just drop dead all of a sudden if we stopped eating for a few hours. Is that uh, a store of both energy and building blocks? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, okay. You know, but mostly on the energy uh, standpoint. Uh, because the building blocks largely can be recycled. Uh, so, you know, we need a way to store energy. And, and that's when, fat, right? And that's essentially fat. Uh, okay. There is some, uh, there's something called glycogen, which is basically a sugar form of storage. Uh, that, But that's, you know, smaller and shorter term. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, when you're in good metabolic health and when your metabolism is working properly... Uh, these things all stay in balance. So metabolism is the process, the body's process of making use of your body's inputs, which is primarily food, but maybe some yeah. other things as well, air and water, uh, air and sunlight. And metabolism is the, the body's use of inputs for building energy usage and energy storage essentially yeah. bad metabolic health then would be your body doesn't do a very good job of that correct yeah and and that's basically it and and as you said you know that that's basically what many of us go through you know we start our lives with you know with good metabolism and you grow as a child and, and, you know, those of us who are not obese as child, you know, we do that well as, as children, you know, someone like myself who was obese as a child, I can go back and say, okay, something was probably off from even earlier. And that gets into, you know, parental inputs and stuff like that. But let's just say, you know, you're a healthy child, you have good metabolism and then, you know, over the years, things start to go off a little bit. And like you said, you get into your 30s and you start, you know, putting on a little extra weight and you get to roll around the middle. And now all of a sudden you don't have the energy to get through your day anymore. And you're drinking more coffee and you're taking afternoon naps. And then you start to notice typically that your blood pressure gets a little high. And now you're going to your doctor and get started on some medicines and, you know, <laughs> You fast forward 30 years and now you're diabetic and have heart disease and you're meeting with me as a heart surgeon because you have blockages in the arteries of your heart. And, you know, one of the problems that I see in medicine these days is 30 years earlier, you know, when you started to get that little bit of, you know, fat around your belly and you started to feel a little tired in the middle of the day, no one stopped and said, hmm, something's not right here. It's only when we get to the end point where you're meeting with the heart surgeon, you know, that someone's saying something's not right here. Uh, and, and that's really, you know, where we've we, the missed opportunity. OK, so what is the what's the truth? Where do we start to unravel these layers of of. Inaccurate information. Uh, things we believe are true that are utterly not true um how do we get down to my 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 belief is that truth always wins yeah mother nature in 13 billion years is undefeated she's never lost yeah um and i to me that's what that's that's the bottom line of truth what is we we can push against reality all we want but reality pushes back 
and always pushes harder. So what do we do? How do we how do we get back to the how do we how do we uh, shed these layers of falsehood as regards metabolic health and fix ourselves? Because I'm guessing that these are things that that we can do individually that we don't have to go to a specialist in order to get this taken care of. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, the first fundamental truth we need to realize we need to get back to again, this is something we knew and forgot is that what we eat is the primary determinant of our health. And unfortunately the vast majority of what we eat these days is not making us healthy, you know, processed foods in all their forms are not what humans were meant to consume. You know, we need to get back. Like you said, mother nature is undefeated and we need to get back to eating whole real foods. Uh, you know, either what grows on the earth or what eats, what grows on the earth directly. So that means vegetables, fruits, and meat, I guess. Yeah, that's essentially it. And okay. in, in their, you know, in their, in as unprocessed a form as you can get them is really what I tell people is the best way to eat them. So, uh, you know, eat whole real foods, meats, vegetables, fruits. Uh, there, there's, there's some debate, there's some nuance there into how much of each, but you know, if you just start with that, you're going to make a whole lot of uh, progress. And, uh, you know, when you're preparing those things, when you're cooking those things, don't use the processed ingredients, you know, that, that is in almost everything we eat these days. A good example is, uh, you know, eat the steak cooked with just some butter, you know, another animal product, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, the, uh, over the hamburger, uh, with the bun that's made from processed wheat and, you know, vegetable and seed oils and sugars and the toppings that are, you know, basically all just sugar, ketchup, you know, yeah, barbecue sauce, things like that. Uh, you know, just eat the whole real foods, uh, the French fries, you know, that are cooked in vegetable and seed oils, these processed, you know, seed oils, um, you know, are, are the things that we need to get rid of. Anything that comes in a box uh, should not be eaten, despite <laughs> what it says on the label. You know, they'll, they'll say heart healthy. They'll have the American Heart Association stamp on it. Uh, you know, there is no food that comes in a box that I consider to be, you know, beneficial to your health is the bottom line. Um, why does the American Heart Association associate themselves with things like that? I don't, I'm not asking if you know, I'm just asking you to speculate. Largely, it comes down to money. I, I mean, you know, it is unfortunately the bottom line. The, the American Heart Association, uh, when you go into the history of the American Heart Association and when it rose to prominence, uh, is, uh, a, you know, basically uh, a gentleman, a scientist, he, you know, and I use that term loosely by the <laughs> name of Ansel, Ansel Keys. Um, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, you know, when the heart disease epidemic started to kind of take off, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, we had a sitting president who had a heart attack uh, while in office, and this really set off the alarm bells. And Ansel Keys, uh, you know, largely because of his own ego, uh, was able to sort of, you know, maneuver his way to prominence. Uh, and brought the American Heart Association with it. His, again, scientific theory was that saturated fat caused heart disease. Dietary saturated fat, which comes primarily from animal products, uh, you know, butter, uh, you know, milk, things like that, uh, eggs, uh, you know, were the primary cause of heart disease. And he either, you know, depending on how you look at things, he was so blinded by that that he ignored the evidence that contradicted it. Or there is some, you know, reason to believe that he actually just, you know, made up his own evidence to support his theory. 
falsified data, selectively used data. Uh, so the most famous example was his, uh, you know, his seminal study was something called the seven country study, where he looked at dietary patterns across seven countries and, you know, basically graphed their input their intake of dietary saturated fat versus their incidence of heart disease and had a nice straight, you know, linear relationship. And what he didn't talk about was that there were actually 22 countries in his data set. And he just picked out the seven countries essentially that lined up along, you know, his line. So that's basically scientific malpractice, right? Um, yes, that's basically scientific malpractice. Okay. So, uh, eat whole foods, either stuff that grows in the earth or stuff that eats things that grow in the earth. So you've been on this journey now for five years. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing that, uh, you're, you've actually developed, uh, I'd hate to call it a side hustle, but, but an additional practice of helping people get healthy without cutting their chest open. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So I now have a uh, telemedicine uh, practice um, where I see people uh, virtually from across the country. And uh, my message is exactly, you know, what I said at the beginning, you know, I, I want people to learn how not to need heart surgery. Uh, and, um, you know, I try and, and, and metabolic health is the way to do that. You know, so again, when you look at heart disease, which remains the number one killer uh, in the United States and worldwide, uh, you know, has been for the past 20 plus years and, you know, will continue to be in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, the root cause of heart disease is poor metabolic health. And again, people say, oh, the but, root you know, cause it, of heart disease is poor metabolic health. Right. And, 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 you know, and, and to go back, I want to wrap my head around this. Metabolic health is defined as how effectively and efficiently your body processes the inputs to turn them into building blocks, energy and energy storage. You got that right. And, you know, people will, of course, you know, say, but you know, my doctor says that cholesterol causes heart disease. And when you look at the data, there have been studies, numerous studies that show this. Uh, if you look at the increased risk of heart disease from having an increased cholesterol level, specifically LDL cholesterol level, versus the increased risk of heart disease if you have markers of poor metabolic health, uh, the comparison is not even close. You know, so having poor metabolic health probably puts you somewhere between a six and a 10 times risk of heart disease versus someone who has normal metabolic health. Okay, having so an, six to 10 times, to put that in, in maybe more comprehensible terms, 600% to a thousand percent more likely. Yeah. And you talk, right. you, you just use the phrase markers of metabolic health. Um, are those markers that any any of us can can use to assess ourselves? Yeah, so there there are five markers of metabolic health. Uh, you know, so two of them you can basically get yourself. Your waist circumference uh, is number one. So you measure the circumference of your waist at your belly button. Uh, you know, with a tape measure. And uh, for, for a man, anything over 40 inches is considered unhealthy. For a woman, anything over 35 inches is considered un, unhealthy. Is that regardless of how um, tall you are? Regardless of how tall you are. And, okay. and, you know, some people debate that, but, you know, that's the official measurement. And I think that's a pretty good measurement. Uh, the number two measurement is your blood pressure. And if the top number of your blood pressure is over 135, or the bottom number is over 80, again, that is considered a marker of poor metabolic health. Wow. Uh, the other three are blood tests that you need to get. Uh, your fasting blood glucose, so the sugar level in your blood when you haven't eaten for about 10 to 12 hours, and anything over 100 
is considered, you know, poor metabolic health. Uh, your HDL cholesterol level, so that's what people commonly refer to as good cholesterol. And uh, the cutoff there, uh, if you're a man, anything under 40, if you're a woman, anything under 50 is considered unhealthy. You want that number to be the higher, the better. Be higher. Okay. Yep. And then the last one is uh, called triglycerides, which is another type of cholesterol in our blood. And uh, anything over 150 uh, is considered unhealthy. So those are the five measures of metabolic health. And when you look at those five measures, 88% of the adults in the United States as of 2016 had at least one of those measures abnormal. So in other words, only 12% wow. of the adults in the United States as of 2016 could meet all five measures of, of perfect metabolic health. Wow. Okay. You just blew yeah. my mind. Yeah. Wow. That, that truly is a staggering statistic. Uh, and, and to and what do you attribute this? Known. What do you attribute this epidemic of poor metabolic health? Is there a, 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 a relatively simple underlying cause or is it pretty complex? Yeah, I think it's the food we eat. You know, I mean, bottom line is it's the food we're eating every day and it's the lack of attention to that food uh, and to, you know, the impact of that food on our health that has led us to where we are. Okay, I want to I want to follow up with a couple of questions. One was going to harken back to where we to, to quite a while back. You talked about saturated fats. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are at least three kinds of fats that I've seen. Saturated, monounsaturated, mono and polyunsaturated. What does all that mean? And does it matter to, to our discussion? Yeah, it does. So, um, you know, basically those three categories refer to the chemical structure of the fats uh, that are in our food. Uh, and, and you're right. Those are the three broad categories, uh, saturated, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. And, and, you know, specifically what it has to do with is whether or not all the bonds between the chemicals and the food, you know, in those uh, fats are double bonds versus single bonds. Uh, but, you know, doesn't really matter that much what, it, you know, what it means on a biochemical level. Um, essentially. Um, you know, the data, the data that I have reviewed, you know, and many others have reviewed, um, would seem to suggest that polyunsaturated fats are particularly harmful to our me metabolic health. And realize that these fats uh, get incorporated into the cell, into the, you know, are used to build the cell membranes of all of the cells in our body. And they also are inputs into what are called the mitochondria, which are sort of the, uh, you know, the, the metabolic machinery of our bodies. Right. Uh, they're the actually like sort of the factories that are making the uh, energy within our cells. And, you taking know, the, taking the inputs and converting them into usable chemicals that our bodies use for energy. Right. Okay. Right. So, you know, what so this happened, is like, this is would be kind of like uh, uh, sand in the gears of the machinery, maybe that's that exactly a good metaphor? It. that that really is a good metaphor, because, uh, you know, the polyunsaturated fats are more unstable. They have uh, more, you know, opportunities on a chemical level to basically get sort of misshapen or uh, broken, uh, what we call oxidized and uh, start to damage our, you know, our cells. And uh, despite that, you know, the polyunsaturated fats, vegetable and seed oil, you know, if you believe the American Heart Association are the healthiest oils to consume. Uh, but these are the oils that are oxidized most easily. These are the most processed oils as opposed to the largely saturated fats that are in, you know, animal products. So this is like uh, butter and what? Lard uh, and tallow. Lard. Yeah. All the things that our grandparents used to use to cook uh, versus all the things that we currently use to cook. 
Wow. Uh, you know, and, and then things like olive oil and avocado oil, for instance, fall in the middle. You know, they're they're largely monounsaturated fats, um, which seem to be, you know, pretty much OK for us. Uh, but, you know, again, more, the narrative, more chemically stable. Yeah, more chemically stable and okay. don't seem to have these negative effects. Uh, so, uh, you know, that that's kind of where we're at. You know, again, we're at you talk about the deception and the deception was that saturated fat is unhealthy and therefore polyunsaturated fats further away from the saturated fats must be the healthiest. And that was the wow. thinking and that was the way that everything was sort of directed uh, for 50 years, you know, 50 plus years now. And again, I just point to the simple evidence, you know, in, in the end, you know, people think, oh, you're a heart surgeon. You must be like all this complex thinking and all this. And I'm like, no, I'm actually a very simple guy. And I just look, you know, we've had 50 years of demonizing saturated fats, gradually lowering the amount of saturated fats that, you know, we're supposed to eat and that we have been eating. And we've been increasing the amount of polyunsaturated fats. And we have gotten more and more unhealthy during that time. So, you know, it just well, that, uh, that's a basic, you know, kind of data point for me that says something can't be right here. So I, I'm, I want to just want to comment on that. So what you're describing is the kind of questioning. Um, questioning approach to received wisdom that you say is largely driven out of medical schools. You somehow managed to survive medical school with that ability to question the received wisdom intact. And you were able to just simply look at the raw data and say, hey, this is what, this is what the data says. How come we're getting good results with this and not good results with that? But had you asked those questions in medical school, you would have been drummed out. Am I right? Uh, largely so. I, I think I probably wouldn't have made it through medical school. That leads me to my follow-up to my to, to the second question that I had. This is simply an observation from watching the world that I grew up in. You know, I can pull out my high school yearbook that's on the the bookshelf behind me from 1978, and there are no obese people. There are no obese people in my high school yearbook. There's one guy who we would say is overweight, who'd look very normal today, and one girl. My graduating class had 275 students in it, um, and the high school had roughly 800. Out of 800 people, there might be four who we would say were a little rotund. So that's the world I grew up in, and I've watched the last 40 years, and you just use the the... the 88% of Americans have at least one marker of metabolic ill health. This is what I've observed. I don't know if these are related. I've observed that starting roughly the early to mid 80s, about the time that they told me that margarine was better for me than butter, and I should avoid eggs at all costs, and it's better to drink skim milk than whole milk, about the same time, I watched a rise in this pooch in the belly that, I mean, when I was in high school, girls didn't have poochy bellies. They had flat bellies. They were sexy. I still think flat bellies are sexy. Maybe that's just because of the way I was raised. But I've watched over 40 years as, as it seems like people have gotten fatter and fatter. I watched... Uh, a year and a half ago, I think it was, it was it was just before the big Chinese flu thing ha all happened, a movie was released called Apollo 11. And it was made from archival footage of the actual Apollo mission, which was 1969. Somebody found a bunch of film in the basement that had never been seen before, bought the rights to it, put a soundtrack to it and made a movie. It was brilliant. The whole Apollo 11 thing is mind blowing. The other thing that blew my mind was I watched these crowd shots from 1969 
thousands of people along the 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 observation area uh, at Cape Canaveral, or I guess Cape Kennedy was what it was called back then. There were no fat people. And all the shots inside Mission Control, there were no fat people. And all the crowd shots of 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 the parades where the Apollo astronauts came back, there were no fat people in 1969. There just were almost no fat people whatsoever. This is a very long discursion I've taken here. So I observed these two things. One, in the early 80s, they told me all this stuff that I'd been eating all my life was bad for me, and it just, it just struck me wrong. And at the same time, I watched people get fatter. Are they the same thing? They, they are, you know, and yet, um, you know, I see it now. I didn't see it then. You see it. But largely, it, you know, the healthcare system certainly doesn't see it. Um, do, they, you know, do they not see it or is it in their best interest to ignore it? Well, you know, that, of course, is, is uh, you know, the, the discussion point in the debate. Um, and I would say that at this point, um, it's not in their best interest to see it. You know, we, we have gotten to a point now that the system has been built upon these principles. And there is no way to start to go against these principles, to start to question these principles without basically blowing up the whole system because it's not only our healthcare system that's built upon this it is now our entire food industry our farming wow. you know all the incentives that go into farming are geared towards jet you know growing these types of foods our whole pharmaceutical industry again is built upon this you know don't worry about what you eat. We have the medicines to, you know, undo the effects of that, wow. uh, you know, or basically medicine, you know, pharmaceuticals, food, farming. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and that leads us basically to government. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the, the government obviously underpins all of these things. And so I, I think we're at a point now where, to start to counteract this narrative uh, is going to take some very serious uh, undoing of the systems that are in place, the institutions that are in place. But we're coming to a reckoning because the, the bottom line is that these things are destroying our, you know, civilization. You know, if not undone, these are going to be the undoing of our civilization. You look at you know, wow. from a financial standpoint, you know, the United States is being bankrupted by the cost of its health care. And, and, you know, this is what's driving the cost of that health care. Um, you know, we are at a point where we cannot get enough, you know, uh, young people who are fit enough to serve in the armed forces. You start to see, you know, fundamental things like this that are that, you know, are ultimately going to destroy our our society if if we don't start to undo them. Okay, so I've got to assume that um, you are not just uh, in this for yourself. I've got to assume that you've you are uh, uh, lighting a candle in this in this darkness rather than merely cursing the darkness. What is it that you are currently doing? to uh, help people on an individual level reverse th the effects of 40 years of deception in the uh, health care, food production, farming, and pharmaceutical and government industries and institutions. What are you personally doing? Yeah, so there are a number of things that I'm doing. The first, like I mentioned, is I've established uh, Ovadia Heart Health. It's a uh, telemedicine practice where I work with individuals and groups of individuals. I, I actually uh, do group coaching programs for businesses uh, to try and get their, you know, their employees as a whole healthier. Uh, now, and can, can our listeners, can my listeners just in general get a hold of you? Are they, are, are yes. you available that way? How do they get yeah, a hold if of you? you? Go to, 
ovadiaheartheath.com. So O-V-A-D-I-A hearthealth.com uh, right. is the easiest way. You can also follow me on social media. I fix hearts uh, is my Twitter handle. And uh, on Instagram, I'm Ovadia Heart Health. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can find me, uh, just with Google searching Ovadia. Thankfully it's not that common a name. So, uh, you come across it pretty quickly. Uh, I am in the process of writing a book, uh, that will be out, uh, at the end of the year, uh, this 2021, December, 2021 launch date for the book. Uh, and it's going to cover a lot of these principles, uh, oh, cool. and, and then, uh, you know, just really looking to you know always looking to expand my platform and get this message out to more people uh in any way possible so uh you know looking to work with people like yourself who are receptive to hearing this and uh seeing what we can do to you know because i do i do truly believe that ultimately this change is going to have to come from the bottom up this is going to have to be a grassroots oh, efforts Patients and physicians are going to need to partner uh, to basically take back control of health care. Uh, because one of the things we didn't really cover, uh, but, you know, also plays into this, is that physicians have largely become powerless in the health care system. Right. The insurance companies, the, uh, you know, the health care administration, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the food industry, they have all taken control of health of healthcare. And, you know, it's up to individual physicians and individual patients to work together to demand back control of, you know, that relationship. The patient-physician relationship needs to be restored. And I so think ultimately a... those types of grassroots efforts are what we need to do to start making these changes. So aside from, from, going to ovadiaheartheath.com um, how can folks listening work with their physicians to take back control of healthcare what are, are there any other any other guidance you can give well you need to you know individuals need to start you know kind of challenging their physicians on this as well um, you know don't accept the narrative that it is normal to be on multiple medications, you know, as you get older. Uh, don't accept that, you know, we can't do anything, uh, you know, the inevitable progression through high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, don't, don't, that's an inevitable progression. You know, high blood pressure can be cured, not just managed with medications. Uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically, can be reversed, not just managed better with medications. Uh, so, you know, again, patients need to start demanding this of their physicians and start challenging their physicians. And, you know, if you, if you challenge your physician on this and they're ultimately just, you know, not receptive to this or not, you know, willing to look into it with you, then you might just need to find another physician is the bottom line. I don't blame physicians. Physicians are kind of slaves to the system. But I do, you know, sort of, I do blame physicians in that we are not questioning these things. You know, we are seeing our patients get sicker and sicker despite all of our efforts. And we're not stepping back and saying this is unacceptable. Um, you know, we should be able to keep our patients healthy, not just manage their diseases. You know what the healthcare system is. It truly is all centered around disease management, and it's not centered around keeping people healthy. And like I said, I I was just as guilty of uh, you know as everyone else. But now you know I can't unsee what I've seen, and I can't unknow what I've come to know. And so my mission now is to prevent as many people from needing heart disease uh, as possible. Uh, I do continue to operate as a cardiac surgeon because I, you know, unfortunately, there are many, many people who have gotten to that point. And, and once you get to that point, you know, these things that I talk about, metabolic health, are still useful, but they can't undo the damage that has already been done. 
and right. heart disease, heart surgery is still necessary. And I want to be able to help the people in that way. But, you know, the people that I help with heart surgery now, I make sure to talk to them about metabolic health as well. And well, I think that uh, that's a good place to wrap this up. Uh, you've given me several things that that 88% number is going to stick in my mind. Um, but I also appreciate the five markers of metabolic health. So that's uh, ovadiahearthealth.com. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for there uh, that uh, on a weekly basis, I you know send out uh, kind of uh, different topics related about metabolic health. There's a free metabolic health assessment that you can take when you sign up oh, for wow. the newsletter. So I would encourage people to do that. And it basically walks you through those five measures and shows you, you know, where you stand in terms of your metabolic health. Very good. Thanks for taking some time with us uh, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you for having me, Jack.